And Francesca, the stage is yours. me is uh, thank you very much uh, it's um, a native interaction that you simply have there is no further engineering needed uh, and uh, <clears throat> shorter is the wavelength of the laser of course uh, shorter is the distance between the atom this goes as a cube uh, larger is the dipole dipole interaction okay so one can create lattice uh, in the UV so around 400 nanometer, then lambda half is 200 nanometer. You put it as close as 200 nanometer. The interaction starts to become the off-site in the order of kilohertz. Okay, so extremely huge. Compared to, always compared with the other scale of the system. What is very remarkable, you know, that it's uh, very special, uh, is that in first approximation, now, doesn't matter for the strength of the dipole-dipole interaction that in first approximation, doesn't matter the height of the potential. So you could put an infinite barrier, an infinite wall almost between these two atoms, the dipole, the off-site dipole-dipole interaction will still be active. Maybe a little reduced because the Vanier function in each lattice side would be reduced, but the dipole-dipole interaction is still active. Okay? And this is really something uh, extremely new. And also, this atom will be connected with this one, will be also connected to that one. If you have two dimensions, will be con connected to the one on the diagonal, to the one in the other direction. So in this sense, uh, can be really, you know, highly connected, every atom is highly connected, correlated, or interacting with all the other atoms. Okay. So then uh, it means uh, that in your Hamiltonian, you will have also to, I think I need to do something to have it close. Okay, so in your Hamiltonian, you will need now to also account for let's say a new term, which is, uh, again, let's say the operator is the one of the dipolar interaction, one r to the cube, and then your field operator. Again, you can do an expansion in the Vanier basis, and you will have this type of term, which is interesting uh, because this term depends uh, uh, on atoms sitting in different lattice side and, uh, and can be further decomposed in uh, two different terms. The one in which uh, you allow uh, I, J, K, L to be, you know, the same, and so this is the on-site interaction, and the other, which is off-site interaction. So you have both components. This is all called off-site interaction or also called the nearest neighbor interaction, okay? So the dipole one, but the dipole one also acts 
on the same lattice side, like it was the contact. But now you see this can be very large because the distance is very small and this goes as one over distance cube, okay? <coughs> and now putting all together this extended Bose-Hubbard model, always in the approximation to have a not higher orbital, no excited band, just, you know, this approximation remain. You have the single particle tunneling. Then you have the on-site interaction, which is both contact and dipolar. And then you have another type of interaction, which is our long range. And now it comes a little bit uh, also the question of one uh, of your colleague, uh, can we make it attractive uh, or repulsive? The answer is yes, uh, and that's very important because it would depend uh, on the, um, uh, let's say, uh, orientation, relative orientation of two atoms. Like here, you can have a different dipolar interaction between this atom or between this atom just because the relative orientation, this, you know, it's and this, let's say, this and this, it's different, okay? Just to see it better, this, let me uh, put an easier angle than the one in the slide. So if I have a, a plaquette like this one, just a square plaquette, then I have one orientation like this. Here, it's repulsive, but here, is attractive, okay? So you can have uh, simultaneously, let's say that there is some direction prefer prefer preferred uh, because nature always want to favor attraction. So this already create a kind of uh, hidden frustration into the system or constraint, let's say. <clears throat> And then uh, here is the contact one, so the usual one, but then also this dipole-dipole interaction. And as I said, again, this is angle dependent. Also, the on-site one can be attractive or repulsive. And this depends on the shape of the Vanier function, the three-dimensional Vanier function that you have in a lattice side. And now you can change the power of the lattice to make the Vanier function of two atoms more elongated or more flat. And with this, uh, let's say the colored zone here, like the little uh, cloud, tells you the aspect ratio. So this is a uh, aspect ratio is the ratio between one to the other, and this is uh, bigger than one, or the other one smaller than one. In this configuration, the dipolar interaction on site is repulsive, and here is attractive. Okay, so you can really shape uh, the impact of the dipolar interaction by shaping. Uh, the lattice that shape the Vanier function, the Vanier function shape the effective interaction because it's an integral over uh, the, fun the Vanier function. One interesting configuration uh, is the one in which you can create a rectangular uh, lattice unit cell because you would like to study the dynamic. So you see in this type of configuration, what do you have? You have the, the spacing between atom uh, so you have the green, two green plane. It's just uh, an example. Of course, we have many more plane. Uh, two green plane, and these two green plane are uh, m much more separated uh, between them. So the dipolar interaction, which depends as one over d to the cube, is weaker between plane. So you would like, and in this way, you can basically restrict the dynamics uh, that you want to study in a two-dimensional plane and not in 3D. That's, so now we are thinking about 2D dynamics. It's also very interesting, but I will not cover, the situation in which there is also coupling, interaction coupling between the plane. Because in this case, you can even create a dimer bound state in different planes. That again, like uh, you know, solid state physics, will kind of give a friction on the motion on the plane due to this uh, dimer, uh, the dimer physics to the next plane. Okay, and moreover, okay, that's our lattice. Uh, we, and then uh, the, how, what determines the orientation of my magnetic field? Well, the external, so the orientation of the magnetic moment of my atom, which is this little arrow here, I can change it as I want. Huh? 
in a complete sphere just because since it's a magnet, it will always orient with the magnetic field. I can change the magnetic field in my experiment as much as I want. Huh? And so the, di the, the atomic dipole will follow, okay? And so this is another, uh, you know, degree of freedom uh, that my B magnetic field can, it's completely tunable, the orientation. And then, of course, uh, I can play with the lattice strengths, uh, and this will allow me to change uh, the aspect ratio, so the Vanier function uh, in the lattice side. Okay, and now we have this Hamiltonian with all these terms, and we will go one by one to see what can be observed. So the first time, which was the first time, yes? Yes, it's possible, but I will not cover this. It's possible the tunnel probability is smaller, but it's possible to have tunnel, nearest neighbor tunneling. That's also possible. In that case, it depends on, uh, let's say, on, dif on different things. I mean, we can maybe discuss later a, a realization that we are currently thinking about that would realize uh, this type of things that you are mentioning. Uh, yeah. So this was the first time uh, this extended bose abbard Hamiltonian have been created, okay? So then the first theme is, uh, let's see that, uh, you know, like uh, learning about the Hamiltonian is really true that there are these terms. I will not have time, but actually we find out that this was in this Hamiltonian type of learning part, we find out that this is not the complete Hamiltonian. There is another term, which is the many-body tunneling. It means that in, in this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, the tunneling, as I told you, is single particle. So one atom tunnel hop to the next lattice side and doesn't make any difference if the lattice side is empty or occupied. But because of the dipole-dipole interaction, now it do make a difference if the lattice side is occupied or not. It might prefer to not tunneling. So there is what it's called, it's, I have many different names. It's kind of, uh, let's say, it's beyond a single particle tunneling. It, you can call it, uh, let's say, mm, a density-dependent tunneling or, I mean, a different name, okay? But this I will not uh, discuss here. So it's a... Uh, that's again the minimal Hamiltonian, uh, but there is now with this complex uh, realization in the lab, for us, uh, the new challenge is to enter in the domain which now is becoming popular called Hamiltonian learning. How do we certify that this Hamiltonian is the right Hamiltonian? Which are the observable uh, that can have, maybe you look at one observable and then you would say, yeah, that's the Hamiltonian. But in reality, maybe there is another observable that will tell you that the Hamiltonian is different. So to find the right observable, to certify the Hamiltonian is an, the next uh, frontier. Now, now we always started from the Hamiltonian and realized it in the experiment, but now the experiment goes even, you know, step forward with all this tunability that maybe you have to go back and change your equation of motion. So Hamiltonian, gross Pitayeski, whatever it is. Okay. <clears throat> So let's start with the on-site interaction. I mean, this on-site is responsible for the superfluid to mott insulator transition. Now you add in addition uh, the on-site dipole-dipole interaction, and so you can uh, simply repeat the superfluid to mott insulator that I was showing here, and then uh, you can, uh, by probing, uh, let's say I look at the central peak uh, here, it's very narrow, it's, this will be this. Uh, the width of the central peak here is very broad, so I will say that my observable for this measurement is the observable in which I look at the width of my central peak. And so when I see that it makes the transition from narrow to large is where the phase transition is happening. Now this is the width, and then you see here it's very narrow, and then here it starts to increase, and then when you are in the mod state, it's very big. And now because the dipole-dipole interaction depends on the orientation of the magnetic field, if I now change the orientation, the point where the phase transition happens 
will be different. And indeed, uh, you can see the difference on the phase transition point, and you can make this difference actually much bigger than this. Uh. This is just for a moderate uh, dis the difference. And what does it mean that the dipole interaction can actually protect the, super the, the superfluid state, uh, so like kind of make the MOT insulator coming after or not? And you can change this uh, and the point just uh, uh, with the magnetic field. And so it's kind of, uh, it's a change uh, of the, if you remember this uh, wedding cake with all the lob uh, of the phase diagram of a superfluid uh, to mott insulator, this would correspond to, you know, change the size of the lob uh, and uh, expand uh, the mott insulator phase uh, or, or contract it just by working uh, on the orientation of the magnetic field, something not possible with usual uh, alkali atoms. You can uh, also measure the energy gap of the, I told you that the MOT state is a gapped state, so you can measure, you know, the energy gap that you would have to, or the energy cost to create a doublon, so two atoms in a leftist side, and so this is, uh, have been done for contact interacting system. How do you do this? You modulate the lattice step at the frequency. When the frequency of modulation is resonant with the energy cost, uh, then uh, you have a, a loss feature like this one. And this is the energy cost for creating just two atoms, this is for creating uh, more atoms, and so on. And so, but when you have the di dipole instead of normal uh, atom, so this energy cost is also something depending on the orientation of the, of the dipole, okay? So this is, let's say, and so you would see that depending on the orientation, you actually have really a shift of the energy, so the mode that you need, so the, the, the energy cost to create this type of double occupied mode state. Mm -hmm. And this shift, uh, it's depending on the orientation, but it's also depending on the Vanier function because you can make it more, you know, squeezing more and making more dipolar or, or less dipolar. And so, for example, you can go up to a shift of the gap, so an enlargement of the gap that goes uh, uh, alpha kilohertz. So very big, just by changing the aspect ratio of your lattice side, so the sh this shape of the blue, Okay, you can really have uh, that the dipolar interaction can uh, change very much the spectrum of excitation of a MOT insulator. Then the next thing, uh, interesting, is to look at the, uh, let's say, nearest neighbor interaction. Okay, and so here, uh, the key point uh, is that this is also uh, depending on the density, on the, so on the angle. So if you, and this is now what I was plotting on the blackboard, you now have all your atom, and you can see the blue here is just to say that there is a bond of attractive interaction, and the red is a bond of repulsive interaction. That's the situation that we are creating in the system. And so now, if we want to modulate the system and try to see the cost of creating Dublin, uh, well, it's making a difference whether you modulate in this direction, where you have only bond of repulsion, or you modulate in this direction where you have only bond of attraction. Bec and, and so that's what you can do. So you start with the situation like this one, with the dipole oriented in the plane, and then I'm modulating this direction, so I'm breaking one bond uh, of uh, attraction, put it here, but then you see I created now this four bond of repulsion. And if I do in the, other, in the other direction, you see here you have two blue and four red, and here you have four blue and two red. This, these two configurations correspond to a different energy, just because of the dipole-dipole interaction. And so you can measure this different energy, and this gives you directly, let's say, the benchmark that indeed the, the nearest neighbor interaction is present in this system, and uh, um, it can be written with this form. Uh, and so this is what we did. Uh, we measured one configuration on the other, the different of uh, energy. All what I was showing here now, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, 
Exactly. So these, uh, uh, let's say, quadratic lattice, as I show you, is done by two beam, no? Uh, there is one lattice beam and the other lattice beam. I have two sets of beam making the lattice. Now I can, if I modulate the intensity of one beam in this direction, I'm breaking bond in this direction. If I modulate the intensity, on, so I'm giving, so I have a way to, by modulating the lattice beam, I have a way to selectively give energy only in one direction. And if I give energy, at some point my, you know, my system goes. Yeah, this is only one. Of course, our system is much, much bigger than this, so you will break several on the same direction. Yeah, but not all of them. It's not, you are not depleting 100%. Huh? You see also here, you, you know, this is the same idea here. You, this is the modulation in one direction. You then, by modulating the lattice step, you promote one atom here, Okay, and you measure the excitation related to this process. There is a critical frequency that make this, but not all the atoms are necessarily doing this. I mean, the, the, the minimum, for example, for this set of parameter, half of the atom were doing this. This is just a, a picture to show what happens to one bond and one atom. But you have more atom in the row that will do the same. Okay, but so far what I wanted to do is just to benchmark the Hamiltonian, but another question is to say, okay, can the dipole-dipole interaction really bring you new phase of matter really quantitatively different? Now, what is interesting to think, it's about um, the, let's say, the, let, in the phase that we are considering, in the MOT phase that we are considering, there is no breaking of the special symmetry of the system. When the system goes uh, to a, what, does, what, what do I mean? There is no spontaneous breaking of the translation symmetry. What I mean? I mean that the lattice uh, is imposing a geometry and the, wave, the global wave function have the same geometry. You see the periodicity of the lattice and the periodicity uh, of the atom is the same. So the wave function and the potential have the same uh, periodicity, okay? So that means there is no breaking uh, of the translational symmetry because the symmetry of the Hamiltonian and the symmetry of the wave function are the same. But thanks to the dipole-dipole interaction, you can go a step forward and have phase of matter, which are called mod crystal, that break translational symmetry. That means that the symmetry of the lattice, so the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, can be different from the one of the wave function, okay? And these have been predicted several years ago, so this is uh, without dipole-dipole interaction, without nearest neighbor interaction, that's the usual phase diagram, and that's it, that's the phase diagram of contact interacting particle, without nearest neighbor interaction. When you go to nearest neighbor interaction, the phase sh change, uh, and you can have uh, this type of pattern, which are signature of spontaneous breaking of translational symmetry. Because although the lattice has always the same periodicity, due to repulsion and attraction of the interaction, the atom will have a periodicity which is different from the lattice. So you can have striped phase, a checkerboard phase, a in general modulated phase of matter. That's a symmetry breaking phenomena. Hmm? Spontaneously, you are not imprinting this. It's the wave function going to this. Is the equivalent of the nil order, is a nematic order, uh, as nematically in space they would organize. Uh, and those are, for example, all the different phases with different filling factor, one fourth, one third, one alpha. And you have all these uh, kind of uh, phases. And very recently, I mean, Marcus Greiner, that has an erbium experiment that we, you know, we collaborated in this paper together. So what we could see is that actually we could see all these uh, checkerboard phases, uh, uh, stripe phases, diagonal stripe phases uh, that originally 
arise in long-range interacting Hubbard model. Oh, these are all realization of different mod crystal, which spontaneously break all one order. The spontaneously break of an order for people that uh, uh, are familiar with solid state physics, what does it correspond? For every spontaneous breaking, there is a new phonon mode appearing in the system. This phonon mode, you know, you can call it in some approximation Goldstone mode. For every symmetry broken, there is a Goldstone mode. This is now breaking a new symmetry, a new Goldstone mode is appearing in the system. This is the predicted, and in the future, this will be also uh, studied in the experiment. <coughs> Yes, with the, uh, I mean, in this. Now, what we uh, are now moving, uh, and uh, all what we did so far, is uh, uh, considering that the particles are all identical. So there is no spin degree of freedom, in the sense they have all the same spin, all identical particles. But what happens if we now want to study something more related to quantum magnetism, uh, that you will need a two-spin state? And now we move uh, to the next section, which is the lattice spin physics with high connectivity. Now, for the lattice spin physics, uh, it's really an extension uh, of the Fermi Hubbard, uh, of the Hubbard model, let's say. And it's an extension in which you consider explicitly that you might have spin up and spin down particle. It's just an extension. And, what, and to have interesting magnetic order, what you really need uh, is to have, uh, let's say, the nearest neighbor interaction between spin up and spin down. In the case of contact interacting atom, uh, there is a way, actually, to create this type of interaction. And this is a, an interaction which is a coming up from second-order perturbation theory. It's a second-order perturbation theory, which is called super-exchange interaction. Okay? And uh, okay, the spin-up and spin-down in the experiment can be realized just by having different Zeeman sublevel, and then I say one Zeeman sublevel is spin up, another Zeeman sublevel is spin down. And you can have a large manifold, okay? So that's what, wh what is a spin up in a neutral atom is a Zeeman energy level. Or and two different hyperfine level, or two different uh, electronic, depending on the atom, two different level. And so I have different energy. They are not degenerating energy, spin up and spin down, okay? That's a really little different with respect to some solid state because electrons spin up and spin down. Okay. And then, uh, okay, how can you realize this now without dipolar interaction? Well, you can do this uh, uh, using this, uh, this idea of super exchange. So there is a reduction of the Hubbard model to the Heisenberg model in the limit of having very, very large uh, uh, on-site interaction U. You can re-end for uh, uh, half feeling. So what you can do, you can, uh, let's say, do a perturbative expansion in uh, uh, T over U. And then you will have that in the zero uh, order, there is also degenerate low energy level space. The first order is a high doubly occupied site. But the second order gives you this term, uh, which is a super exchange. What is J? Actually, J is nothing else than the tunneling square divided U is the, your second order perturbation theory here. And that's the super exchange. And, and the super exchange is kind of a virtual, is a, had, I mean, acting as a virtual process. So you have spin up, spin down. Then there is a, a virtual tunneling to a state very close by with up and down. And then another virtual tunneling that brings you back. So effectively, super exchange is doing this, uh, but passing it to, let's say, together and then here. So there is two. Uh, so here, T, here it's J here. They are the same quantity with different notation, sorry. And, uh, and then you can really start to study and, for example, to write the, um, the, let's say, the Eisenberg model for boson in optical lattices, and then you will have, uh, you know, the tunneling uh, in the two different directions, the, the U, and then the order that you have, whether you have uh, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic order, depend on the on-site interaction, in this case, whether the in interspin on-site interaction is bigger than the the 
intraspin or the contrary. You can have ferromagnetic cord or antiferromagnetic cord. And this is something which I already show you that have been observed with, uh, with atom. But uh, now the point is uh, that the super exchange, uh, it's great that you can have uh, without uh, native long range interaction, but it's also painful. Okay, because you know you need to have very very high barriers, so you need to suppress the tunneling. Is kind of a physical whether you don't have the external degree of freedom are completely frozen, and you cannot tune too much. It's not a native interaction. It's a second order small correction. It's small. Huh? But if you now have a really long range dipolar interaction, instead of having the smaller super exchange term, you really have a native long range due to the dipole dipole interaction. Okay, and this is super interesting. And again, you can realize this lattice spin physics with nearest neighbor interaction also with a polar molecule, with Rydberg atom, with ion, and we, I mean, uh, as well with magnetic atom, which are the focus here. And now that would be your new Hamiltonian here. And uh, so you have the off-site uh, dipole-dipole interaction. And then you can rewrite your Hamiltonian in terms of sigma plus sigma minus, uh, which is basically the, di and that's a direct uh, spin exchange interaction that allows you to do this. You don't need to pass to any you know, virtual state. It's really direct uh, spin exchange interaction, which is magnetization conserving. That's also important. The total magnetization, it's conserved. So the sum of the spin is conserved during. So if you have one up and one down, you can do this, but still you have one up and one down. Okay, so that's mean magnetization conserving. And then, which is also interesting, is a good in this Hamiltonian that we have another term, which is a single particle term. It's quadratic in the spin in SZ, and actually these are can be controlled with magnetic field or with the tensorial. You remember the tensorial and I thought uh, polarizability, that's what it is. You can control this term here and what's the effect of this term? Well, is that if you have now three spin state, you can have them having exactly the same energy splitting. This is the on resonant condition delta here that it's, there is no difference in energy, the difference in energy is zero, but with resonant light, you can you know, also shift uh, and make this out of resonance, or you can do the contrary. You can start with an out of resonance situation and you go on resonance. If you are out of resonance, uh, so that the energy, energy splitting uh, between the different spin state is different, then the spin, uh, the exchange dynamic cannot occur because it will require energy to do this. Because you have two atoms here, one goes up, the other will go down, but energy should be conserved. But if this energy splitting is different, that's not, not possible to conserve. Okay? And uh, yeah, so that means uh, that you can initialize uh, you know, in our case with erbium, we have many, many spin state, uh, and I can initialize uh, all the atom in a given M state. Uh, let's say I choose the yellow one here, so the second to last. Uh, and then I put all the atom uh, in this specific spin state. They are frozen, they don't move, there is no tunneling, there is a near dipole-dipole uh, interaction off-site. They are all identical fermions. And I start in the, and, and my question is, if we prepare a pune spear state, how does it evolve under the Eisenberg Hamiltonian? How do the correlation evolve the spin excitation? What is interesting is that they cannot move, but what can spread is the spin internal degree of freedom. But the atom don't move. The spreading is only in the internal degree of freedom. And now, if, uh, as I told you, this energy splitting is different from this one, nothing happens. The population that I have prepared in the yellow stay, stay almost constant over two seconds, okay? But if now I switch on light, I use this quadrat, this light, let's say tensorial light shift, and I put this level on resonance. You know, I'm putting this level on resonance. Now, as soon as I do this, and I can do this very fast with light, I can initiate a dynamic in the system where I start to have this atom. 
moving and changing. And then you see that the spin population of the yellow is decreasing and the spin population of the other state is increasing. And the interesting part is that all these, uh, all these dynamics in the spin domain of freedom is not, cannot be described by mean field. It's really due to quantum fluctuation. The mean field prediction is this one, no dynamics. Uh, and also all this process uh, conserves the total spin. It's totally magnetization conserving, okay? So, and it's really a phenomena completely driven by quantum uh, correlation. Then uh, there is the problem of the theory, and that's where now you come into the game, of course. <laughs> And uh, it's how do we describe, we have many atoms into the system, it's purely quantum, cannot be described by mean field. You can actually not very well do exact diagonalization. I mean, if you have five spin state, you can have probably seven atoms, that's it. That's already your limit of what you can or you cannot uh, uh, simulate. Um, and so there are several methods. Uh, we developed one together with Ana Maria Rea Gila and Bihu Izu. Uh, that at the time she was also Agila. And so, and their model was uh, about, you know, computing uh, the dynamics uh, using uh, the truncated Wigner approximation. That's a method, that uh, is an approximation. And I think that this method, uh, you know, it's going very well in the early dynamic of the system, but then uh, it's kind of not anymore really reproducing the long time dynamics. Now the question is how can we do better? Can we do better? And this is an open question which I leave to you because I think at the moment that's not really clear. How to do better in simulating already this system is beyond what can be, uh, let's say, simulated. Another thing that we did in the, in the experiment is to notice that the exchange interaction, this one spin up and spin plus, depend on the initial state. In, in the sense, it depends on the initial M state that you choose. You know we have this uh, 13, uh, actually for fermions, 20 spin state we can initialize in any space. And actually, the strength of the exchange is uh, you know, changing depending on M. And what we could do, we could uh, produce any of this initial spin state, and we could see the dynamic or the spin cone, how does it spread? And we were actually really look, seeing, uh, observing that there is really this effective uh, interaction is going really quadratic uh, with the M state. Yeah. So now I would say that these are kind of more or less, uh, it's uh, the starting point, uh, all these long range interacting neutral atom in lattice is uh, at its starting, it's a new direction, more experiment and more group are working on this. So stay tuned, at the moment we just made the first uh, really small step toward this physics uh, and the field uh, will certainly uh, develop further. And with this, uh, I have a question because now I have finished my part of the lattice uh, and I wonder if uh, I have still time. Uh, I have more time uh, because I want to show you something in the bulk. Do you have still energy <laughs> for a bit of uh, physics in the bulk? Uh? Okay. Yes. This at all. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, mm, let's say, the energy. Yeah, so the, this is a bit uh, now going back uh, to the root of the question because the lattice uh, can do a lot of solid state Hamiltonian, it's very nice, but it's actually also facilitating uh, because you know where the atom are, you can, you know, froze the degree of freedom and so on. But what is really the, how much can we push quantum simulation or how much can we know about, you know, equation of uh, motion or law determining the behavior of the system in the bulk. In the bulk is uh, much more painful, or even, you know, this uh, measuring a uh, correlation entanglement. I mean, uh, have you ever noticed this very little has been done, but not because it's not interesting, but more because it's very tough at the moment. 
No? But now what I want to sh also show you is uh, how incredible this dipolar interaction is, even if you have atom in the bulk. And so how surprise can be happening? I mean, uh, the ingredient of the game you know already, we don't have a lattice anymore. There is no lattice. And uh, you have a bulk system with 10 to the 5 atoms in an harmonic potential, OK? They can move in this harmonic potential as they want. Every particle is identical. That's important. That's why we're quantum, OK? They are indistinguishable. And now you know the two ingredients. Each atom can interact with the other. And there are two sources of interaction. One is the contact one. We know these uh, sphere things. And the other is the dipole-dipole interaction going at long range. Now, as uh, uh, we already mentioned, the scattering lens A, now we uh, spoke about the scattering lens here, the scattering lens can be positive, so repulsive, repulsive contact interaction, or negative attractive contact interaction. I will put here always repulsive. Ah, it's repulsive. Now I have my dipolar interaction is an isotropic. Now I don't have a lattice that it's, uh, you know, blocking uh, the external degree of freedom. Now every particle can move and organize as they want. There is no pinning, OK? So where do I want to go? OK, so then the atom, not I, but the atom can decide how to align with respect to the other. With the lattice, I was imposing one a function. I increased this. You have to do that, that. No, here they are free. I, they are free in the big container. And so you have to notice that they can become attractive or repulsive. OK. And now start the first puzzle. Huh? The story and the discovery of the phase of dipolar quantum matter was uh, an escape room game for us uh, in the last 10 years. And that this lesson of how you feel in an escape room uh, or in a quantum escape room is what I want to show with you now. So. Because I have two independent sources of interaction, I can you know, tune at will. I can make one stronger, one weaker. But really, the interesting point is when I make this competition of interaction, something unique to magnetic atom you cannot do in Rydberg. I make a competition, and I want to know which one is working. Well, if you have a, a linear equation, then it's enough. You say, OK, this is a value of 3, this one is a value of 4, this one is linear, is increasing. But if the interactions are nonlinear, so are depending on the density, the game changes. Because even if the prefactor is the same, but if there is the possibility to be attractive, the atom will try, tend to attract, to be together and attract in this orientation. By doing this, they increase their local density. By increasing the local density, they increase the interaction. By increasing the interaction, they are even more favored to do this. That's the essence of collapse. If you have any system in nature with attractive interaction, density dependent, what does it happen? They will tend to you know, beat as much as together, because attraction decreases energy and because nature wants to decrease energy. By doing this, they increase the density as crazy. At some point, they explode. The density is too high. There is really this uh, hard wall uh, you know, that they cannot be closer than this explosion. OK? Fine. Attractive interaction. So if I have that the strengths, uh, it's the same, uh, but those are density dependent, there is a natural favorable to unbalance the total interaction. That's what it happens, for example, in a collapsing magnetized molecular cloud core from the protostar. As the collapse of uh, you know, stars uh, is exactly like this. They first have an increased density, then boom, they explode. Attraction is winning. Hmm? Attraction is winning over repulsion. What is the repulsion here is always kinetic energy. Is a repul is the stabilizing mechanism of universe in some part is kinetic energy. OK, and then we said, OK, and this type of experiment was done at many years ago in chromium, which is a magnetic atom, but not as magnetic as erbium and dysprosium. They said, OK, let's uh, organize this in a way that attraction will you know, trigger a collapse. And they saw that in 
less than half a millisecond, a nice dipolar BC was collapsing. You see now at the center there is maximum intensity density, is dark, and here there is almost no density, is light. And uh, it's collapsing. Then you can ask why it's collapsing, uh, let's say, look, the similarity of this geometry with this geometry. Why it's collapsing in, the, in type of D wave? Indeed, this was called a D wave collapse. Well, if you now are familiar with Lagrange polynomial, that's a D wave Lagrange polynomial. It's exactly like this. The, sh the D wave shape is the shape of the dipole dipole interaction. Hmm? Okay, very well established funding. This one is uh, collapsing. We understand that traction is uh, winning. Everything fine. Huh? Big surprise is only the shape. But then if we think about, okay, it's recovery, the dipolar shape, it's fine. Huh? Because there is line of attraction and line of repulsion. So it makes sense that the shape is not an isotropic because the interaction is not isotropic. Then we said, okay, now let's repeat with Erbium and Dysprosium. Actually, with Dysprosium in Stuttgart was repeated. We should see the collapse in the same way. Hmm? Because those are even more magnetic, so even more attraction, even faster collapse. But actually, this was the first big surprise because the system, this is the system of Dysprosium atom, uh, was not collapsing, but was kind of creating a micro droplet. Leader, this is a gas, it's a gas phase that starts to <laughs> separate. Leader gas, leader drop of gas, very dilute. So you should really imagine alone, I'm not, we are not imposing any geometry. And this leader drop were organizing a type of triangular lattice. This was, a, and this was then stable, living for a very long time. What is going on? Well, that's crazy. And then we also repeated, but in another geometry. And that we saw that instead, so we were kind of changing the geometry of the trap. And then we were seeing that instead of having a, this uh, many crystal, we had only one macro object that increased the density, as you would expect by the collapse. You see, this is a usual BC, and this is the new phase that we found. And then we would expect, OK, this increased the density, and then it will collapse. No, it stayed stable. Not only this, uh, that it was stable, but also if I would switch off the trapping potential, this object, which is a gas, do not expand. It's self-bound. It's a gas that without a container is not expanding, and this we measure. Now, the problem of this, uh, when we saw all these things, we could not understand what it was. Why? Because the Hamiltonian, uh, which is in this case the gross Pitayeski, so the Schrodinger equation, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, would never give you this type of solution as a wave function. So something was really puzzling. This is something, and this is really the first key that we were searching in our escape game. Okay, here you can see that this is, a, you know, at the beginning not really expanding this macro droplet. What is going on? If now I just write uh, the Schrodinger equation with kinetic energy, my trap, the contact interaction, the dipole interaction, this gives you collapse all the time. There is no way. And then it's kind of the, the, first, the first time in the, really in the field where the gross Pitayeski failed to describe cold atoms. And actually, what we find out, there was a lot of work, what is going on. We repeat, I mean, I remember in the lab, we were repeating thousand and thousand times the same experiment. We could not believe what the hell, what is going on. I mean, it's really crazy. And then we find out that, that actually, there is another term of interaction that arises that was usually neglected, kicked out. And this is part of this Hamiltonian learning. We do, also in the bose abbard we do a lot of approximation, but then at some point those are wrong, can become wrong. And there was a, a term that, um, that we were, so all the gross Pitayeski is a mean field theory. It's a mean field. It's not a quantum theory. But if you now, what we were neglecting is the first order correction to really quantum correlation, which is called quantum fluctuation. Fluctuation means really have the feeling to tell you it's moving away from mean field. It's not a real fluctuation. It's kind of the next order correlation of, or correction. And this is a new term, which typically is very small, 
But since it rises very fast with density, more than the other two, if there is a collapse that increases density, at some point this guy, boom, jump up, become extremely big, is a repulsive interaction, and that's the function of stabilizing your system. It's telling you, ah, more than this peak density, you cannot have. So you cannot increase more than this. And then, I mean, this is really a density regulator, a new term that had to be added by hand. And so the experiment were driving the theory in this case. And okay, that's simply a constant, but really the important thing is the dependence with the density. And then, of course, how to verify, because this was also not very clear. We then do really high precision spectroscopy of quantum fluctuation, and we could really verify that this is uh, the case. You need quantum fluctuation. That the first enigma were solved. But then comes the second one, because, okay, with attractive dipole dipole interaction is not collapsing. Now I know why. Now, if I put repulsive, uh, if I put repulsive dipole-dipole interaction, so I have repulsive contact, repulsive dipole-dipole, this should be stable. If it was stable with attraction, it will be even more stable with repulsion. Huh? So it will be stabilized. Well, we said, okay, that's easy. We will certainly see this. And indeed, I mean, we see a nice BC, stable, and so on. But then what we want to do is, uh, let's say, we change a bit the contact interaction, and suddenly, spontaneously, this two side peak appeared. In this lecture, in my lecture, where did you saw this side peak? In which figure? Don't you remember the Mott insulator? Don't we have the central peak and two side peak? Was it not interference by matter wave uh, due to a periodic structure? Where does the periodic structure come here? We don't have any lattice. I'm not imposing anything, but this is signalizing a periodic structure. Because always uh, uh, in the momentum space, interference peak in the momentum space signalizes a, a short wavelength in space. What is imposing this? There is nothing in the Hamiltonian that gives you this. And bit, it's like uh, thinking about I have a fluid at rest, I give a, a wave modulation, and then I have a wavy energy. That was our point of view. And indeed, uh, I mean, what happens is that if you have dipole-dipole interaction, what happens is that the spectrum of excitation is changing. And now it's again simulation. I have cold atom, but I will show you uh, helium spectrum of helium type spectrum of excitation, really of a superfluid. In helium, the spectrum of excitation is a phonon, have a maxon, have a minimum that it's called by Landau roton, and then a single particle. This me here it's uh, enormously interesting because you have a time momentum, a specific uh, value of energy where it costs not too much energy to create excitation. So if I give a small kick, nothing excites. But if I give a big kick, then I start to have excitation. But if I give it even bigger, nothing is excited again. There is a minimum. It's like a resonant frequency here. And actually, what it turns out is that if you change the scattering lens, you can even put this roton excitation to zero. So it costs no energy to create this excitation. So the system will spontaneously create this excitation. It costs no energy. <coughs> and then uh, we measure that. So this is the theory. And you see that in the theory, with all our parameters, all the discretization is due to the finite side system. And then we measure the spectrum of excitation. And uh, what we found is a spectrum which is linear, no roton if the contact interaction is very high. But then if we make the dipolar interaction more and more important, it starts bending and you start to have this roton minimum. But then coming back to this figure here, that was the first things we saw in the experiment. We thought there was a reflection from a laser uh, that maybe this is what gives the periodicity, but actually not. This was really the number of atoms in the side peak, uh, let's say the occupation of the roton mode, was first increasing and then stabilizing, which is strange. 
I mean, the Bergoglioub of theory tells you that if you can create excitation, the number of excitation will increase exponentially diverge. Yeah, because it costs no energy and then you have this mode populated. But here it was stopping. Again, stability. Some stationary state, again. Which, what, what does it do this? And what we find out is that actually the system undergo a phase transition. Really the ground state of the system change. There is a many body phase transition that bring you to a new state, I'll just go a little faster, of matter in which the ground state is a modulated state. This modulated state, which was observed without even us having understood this in 2017, was later understood to be a phase transition for a normal BC to a new state which is called supersolid. And this new state is remarkable because uh, it has a broken, uh, uh, let's say, it's fully coherent, so break a gauge symmetry. It's one broken symmetry. And the second one is the broken of the translational symmetry. It spontaneously creates periodic pattern. This is really the finite size system we have in the lab, but actually you could do the calculation for infinite. You have, I mean, an infinite modulation. It's not a finite size effect. It's really the new ground state of the system, where you have the superfluid property and the periodic density. So you have a double uh, broken symmetry state. And this was observed, I mean, precursor in this experiment in my group in 2017, and then later uh, also by my group, the group in Pisa of Modugno and Stutta uh, by uh, Fao. And so how do you lo see the phase transition? Well, we can really probe, and you see this uh, periodic modulation of the system. You can calculate the full phase diagram, and you see that the full phase diagram have three phases. One is the BC. The other is the super solid where there is, a, you know, everything is connected. And then you have this isolated droplet where a really disconnected droplet. Here there, you have phase coherence and modulation. Here you have modulation but no phase coherence. Yes? Sorry? The confining, the confining potential, uh, there is an harmonic confining potential which is very uh, high, like this. So this is responsible of the fact that this one has less uh, uh, matter than this, the peak height is due to the harmonic confinement. But the modulation, if you, it's resisting in flat potential. And variation? Uh, without dipolar interaction, no. You need to have dipolar interaction. This is really an effect coming from the roton in the spectrum of excitation. The roton touched zero. There is a specific roton momentum. The roton momentum gives the roton wavelengths. The wavelengths is this wavelength. And then, I mean, uh, uh, from the phase diagram, then you see unmodulated and phase coherent, modulated and phase coherence, modulated and non-phase coherence. Now, the phase, you know now very well that you can extract from matter wave interferometry, as I showed you before, uh, from the MOT insulator. So when we make expanding, uh, look at the difference. In both cases, I have an interferometric signal Okay, but this one is as a shape and this another shape. Now if I repeat another time the measurement and another time, this is what I get. That if you don't have phase coherence, each time the phase pattern is completely different in this case. And at the end you don't see anything. While in the case of fully coherence, you still see that the interference pattern is always the same. You can build up a function which is called phasor. You can extract a phase, and that's the difference. In the case of isolated droplet, no phase coherence. The phasor spread in 360 degrees. And in the case of phase coherence, there is really a localization of phases just in one sector. And this is the proof of the phase coherence of the system. Uh, since I don't want to go. Uh, 
I want to go here and show you that so far I show you how you can break symmetry, translational symmetry, only in this direction. But actually, the phase diagram that we have calculated is much richer than this. And so you can have, and, but now I show you only the experimental data fitting per very well the, the theory with the uh, quantum correction, so quantum fluctuation on it. You can see I can, you know, change my trap and change the atom number. I have two. Then I can have a zigzag configuration. Then I can have even more extensive. Uh, this is all a gas organizing, and then I can have, uh, you know, even a completely fully phase coherent, uh, let's say, hexagonal uh, system. And of course, when you have an hexagonal system, uh, at least for me, the first thing I want to do, I want to rotate it, uh, and I want to see if I can see vortices. Now, rotation in the experiment is really difficult, uh, okay? But we found a new way. Because as I told you, the di all, all of these atoms are very magnetic. So you can see one of these maximum as a gigantic magnet. And the gigantic magnet would align with the magnetic field. So if I simply rotate the magnetic field, each of these spots will rotate together. And uh, the reason why I want to see vortex is because vortex is really what determines the difference between a classical fluid and uh, a quantum fluid. And now I just would like to show you what is our idea for rotating. I will first rotate for simplicity, not a super solid state. I want to rotate a normal BC, OK? So my BC is a little bit elongated along the magnetic field direction because uh, uh, the, the dipolar interaction is attractive in this direction. Then if I give an angle, this is really the, the ground state that's all from our calculation. Then the system is rotating. And if I start to rotate the magnetic field, the gas is rotating together. And if I rotate fast enough, then vortices will apply in the system. And so the, those are our simulation. So it's the gross, extended gross Pitayeski simulation. This is the early time dynamic. I put them in rotation. I rotate the magnetic field. The system start to rotate, start to lose matter, this kind of galaxy type of shape. But you see that some vortices, some black hole here, are in the low density. And then after a long time dynamic, all these vortices are starting to enter into the system. And then we wanted to see this in the experiment. And now look how beautiful it is. This is the simulation. And this is our experiment really you know, behaving in the same. And you see the vortex appearing. Of course, not as easy in the theory, but that's experiment that experiment. And now we wanted to do the same with the super solid. Now, there is a classical analog of what I'm telling you. Imagine that this is our super solid, that's a ferrofluid. And what we would like to do, we would like to rotate our super solid and see if we can have vortices entering inside. And that's um, now, uh, let's say, uh, where I am? The simulation, I start to rotate my super solid. And then uh, if I rotate fast enough, after a while, you would see that in the phase, there is a phase jump of 2 pi that goes from yellow to blue. And you see now, it's yellow to blue, yellow to blue, yellow to blue vortices are starting entering to the system. So you can indeed create vortices by magneto steering the system. Those are the experiment. It took us almost one year to learn how to rotate a fragile state like a super solid. It was really a difficult things. But then there is a little problem because in the theory, I can access the phase map and tell you that there is a vortex here. But in the experiment, we probe the density profile, not the phase. And in the density profile, you see nothing because the vortex is a low density. But in between the droplet, there is also low density, so you cannot distinguish. So we had a little bit the idea, and I want to close, uh, to kind of rotate a super solid. Uh, I would like to produce a super solid, rotate such that there is a vortex inside, and then just for visibility, I want to melt the super solid, and the vortex is a topological excitation remain trapped. And so this is what we did. 
we prepared the super solid, we started to rotate very slowly, nothing happens, and then we started to rotate very fast and then melting, and you see now the vortex that appear, but the interesting part is that for the super solid is predicted that the vortex enter before, and that's really the fingerprint of difference between uh, B, C, and the super solid vortex. And, uh, and then we see here that there is an intermediate frequency where you would expect a vortex in the super solid and not here. You can also see vortex uh, as a phase winding in the interference pattern. Indeed, if you now do a toy model in which you have three Gaussian toy model, and then you expand this three Gaussian and there is uh, all with the same phase, uh, the let's say the interference pattern will be this type of interference pattern where you have at the center some matter, but if there is a, a phase winding, uh, like a vortex, uh, then you would have a minimum. This is just a toy model of a normal Gaussian. It's really basic matter wave interference. Okay, the, vor the presence of a, a, a phase winding uh, of two pi will be, will be uh, zero in the density. And if we do our full numerics, uh, with dipolar interaction, our trap, we see exactly the same things. If we rotate very slowly, so that, I mean, we are below the critical frequency for created vortices, there is this type of interference pattern with the matter in the middle, and if there is a vortex, there is this, and this is now what we also observe in the experiment, that this is a direct observation of actually the existence of a vortex in the interference pattern of our system. Okay, I think that now this is a, I wanted to show you something more, but I think there is no time. Uh, and so I now just take uh, the opportunity to, you know, thanks the team and to show you the team. That's our team in Innsbruck. And many of the things I show you we have done in the team. We have three experimental team and one theory subgroup. And so there is uh, the Erbium, the Erbium Dysprosium team. We have uh, Atom in a Tweezer experiment, which I didn't have time to show you, and a really great uh, theory sub team. And uh, yeah, now we are also having, uh, you know, putting together quantum gas microscope into the system. And with this, I would like, you know, to thank you for your attention. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting lecture. And we have time for questions. There is one over there. Uh, so, coming back to the uh, phase diagram for the transition to, uh, from Bose-Einstein condensate to super solid, uh, could you explain again what happens as you turn the scattering length, I guess? Okay. Yeah. Wait. Uh, yes. Uh, it happens something very, so, very peculiar, actually. So, so, I think I understood the fact that as you turn the scattering length, the roton minimum softens. And then you have the condensation of rodents, so you have those spatial modulations. But then I, I didn't understand what happens after when you uh, start increasing, continue increasing the scattering length, and you form isolated yeah. droplets. So, so somehow you have uh, two possibilities. So there is, a <clears throat> so there is the spectrum of excitation, uh, excitation as you said, uh, phonon, maxon, the roton soften completely. Uh, so this is uh, K, and that's energy, and that's the roton minimum. Now, at this point, uh, you have the full f softening. What happens if you, what happens at this point? You have two possibilities. Either it's becoming, uh, uh, sorry, where are you? Ah, sorry. Uh, either it, uh, it's becoming uh, unstable, so you start to have, uh, let's say, this uh, imaginary negative energy, okay? So the system is unstable. There is imaginary moton, roton mode that get populated, and so the system will then be fully excited, okay? And of course, mean field breakdown and everything. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that, the, so kind of, you know, divergence of the 
rotor population. That's kind of instability. You would see what is the number of rotor particles that you create uh, as a function of time, and you kind of uh, depopulate completely with the condensate. Everything goes to the rotor, and it's an uh, imaginary energy. The other possibility is that, the phase, that there is a phase transition. And this is actually what happens, but for the phase transition, you need uh, something that stabilizes. And again, is this quantum fluctuation that has the role, again, the one that I show you for the single, for the macro droplet, this additional term that again enter into play to stabilize and to avoid that the system, let's say, diverge. So with the addition, without quantum fluctuation in the gross Pitayevsky, this will simply die. With quantum fluctuation, you have the phase transition from a ground state, which is a, a usual atomosphere, may let's say BC, to our super solid phase. Yes, this I think and actually then what happens on the spectrum of excitation happened what I told you. We are breaking at the translational symmetry. We also measured the spectrum of excitation, but I had no time to show. And what happens is that the second band, actually I should do it in the other way, a second band is appearing. So you have two Goldstone mode, two branch in the spectrum of excitation. One is the crystal one, and the other is the superfluid branch. And we measured the two branches. Okay, but what's happening then when you start forming isolated droplets? So this, this all's in the, in the red region, right? In the red region. That's in the red region. Then when I do, when I am in the, so when I move from the red, this is the spectrum of excitation of the red region. When I move to the black, more I move to the blue one, this is the superfluid branch and this is the crystal branch. The crystal branch starts to become harder. The superfluid starts to soften. When you do the crossover, that's not a phase transition from super solid to crystal. This branch vanish completely. And the spectrum of excitation become like this. It's really the brilliant zone repeating. It's one branch, you don't have any more phase coherence, so you lost this symmetry breaking, it's totally uncoherent, so you go back to one branch, and, uh, which is uh, for the crystal mode, so all what is stiff mode. And we measure all the spectrum as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there more questions? So I have a question regarding the spin dynamics in your previous slide. So uh, when you're changing actually the internal degree of freedom, like you are exploiting many di different spins. So uh, like what is the experimental way to do, like uh, are you exploiting with the Raman sideband cooling for the internal degrees of freedom or how, what is the bandwidth of the light which you are using and what is the energy difference in your system between two so spins? So we typically start by, mm, so we don't need uh, any further cooling. No, because we don't need sideband cooling or anything like this. We initialize the system in one, so we produce a very cold uh, quantum degenerate, uh, let's say lower band of one spin state, okay? Then uh, we have different way to populate different uh, spin. For example, we can do in the block sphere pi pulse, so like Rabi oscillation, and I populate whatever I want uh, with whatever population. So like uh, the resonant light matches with your pi pulse? Uh, the right, so the pi pulse that we do is a, two, is a type of, uh, you have, so there are really very different technique. If uh, the energy splitting between the Zeeman level, it's quadratic. Let's say like if your atom have hyperfine structure, then the coupling with magnetic field is also quadratic term, is quadratic Zeeman shift. Then if it's quadratic, the energy splitting is different between the different uh, level. And then if it's different, uh, um, then you can simply put radio frequency. And then you know exactly where you go and you stop, okay? 
to do the spin preparation. If it's not quadratic, it's linear, then it's always, if you put a RF signal, it coupled to everything, so you are not deterministic. There you have a different way, like two photon Raman excitation, so you put up and then down in another spin state, and that's, uh, for example, one thing which is done. Or you can do steer up, uh, or you can do um, two rabbi parts. In our case, for the boson, we do two rabbi parts that couple to the clock transition, as I show you in one slide. Okay, thanks. I have another question regarding how you extend your super solid phase to the 2D. How did I? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, uh, uh, this is a, is, a go, I mean, uh, is a good, a very good question. And uh, I don't know if I have now, no. Um, so let's say what is really interesting is that when you have a phase diagram, typically you think to have, okay, I don't know, two axes. But in reality, the phase diagram of a dipolar uh, gas is extremely rich. You have several control parameters. The trap, the atom number, the dipolar interaction, the scattering length. So these are things that you can independently tune. Now, if you fix the scattering lens and you change the atom number and the trapping confinement, you can reach a different phases. You can reach a linear five droplet, a linear seven droplet, zigzag, hexagonal phase, or fully 2D. So what we had to do in the experiment was not only taking the trap to be round, but also to increase the atom number. And then you enter in this uh, fully circular super, super solid that I was showing, the one that then we rotate. Further questions? So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much again.